You with her radio sport. It's coming up to 14 minutes after nine. And with me now is uh, Val Adams to talk about her book, which I think is being officially uh, launched today or in the next couple of days. Uh, Val, first of all, uh, good morning. Nice good morning. to nice to have you here. I know you've got a very busy day with the media today. Thank you. Uh, so I think we'll get straight down to business, as it were. Can we start with London, which is probably a fairly logical place to start? I just want to read something that uh, your coach, Jean-Pierre, JP, as you call him in the book, uh, said to Phil Gifford in the book um, uh, about a spring training camp I think you had in Switzerland before the Olympic Games this is JP talking to Phil I said to Val you will have to throw 2150 if you are to win against a doped athlete so did you know when you got to London when you stepped into the circle that you were competing against drug cheats no, um, you know, when you go to a major event like that, all you focus on what you got to do. Um, obviously, before even competing, there was a lot of um, stuff that I had to deal with. So I had to mentally prepare myself to get myself in the best frame of mind to be able to compete. But um, her and, and, and what she has done didn't actually cross my mind at all. Does it not sometimes, in, in just the, the odd private moment that you have, that you get very angry, because you know your sport obviously well, you don't get angry at the fact that you're having to compete against drug cheats? Um, it's actually not drug cheats. It's probably, well, it's just her right now, like in the shop us today. Um, the thing that really got me was that I did beat her in, in May. Um, in, in Rome at the first time really that I competed at by a metre and a half and then she came back obviously six, seven weeks later and throughout the uh, throughout the game so she didn't actually leave Belarus at all during that period mm-hmm. and she stayed in Belarus and uh, she advanced as she did but I didn't I cannot waste any energy that I did have on her and what she was doing in Belarus. All I had to do was compete, uh, to train accordingly to my program and make sure I was, I was competing well at every competition that I was at and I was actually progressing the best I've ever had, and you know, in in my career this year, leading up to the game, so I was prepared for something big mm. in London. But at other parts, another part in the book, and other parts in the book, you come out very strongly against those people in your sport who take drugs, and you don't believe, contrary to the current kind of protocol, you believe they should be kicked out and booted out of the sport forever, right? Abs- absolutely. I mean, it's. it's it's like when they say in relationship, once a cheater, always a cheater. Um, that's my philosophy: is that once you're done for drugs, you, get, you know you should be booted out and never and never let back in. And because us athletes are out there day in, day out, you know, sweating and hurting to do so well, and then they're elsewhere taking products and stimulants, that, you know, mm. and forms of things to try and make the performances advance. Okay, so when, when you're on the uh, well, when you're on the podium as you were in London, getting your silver medal at yep. the time. What were you processing inside of you? I mean, disappointment, obviously, that you hadn't won the gold medal, but somewhere in your mind, again, was the fact that you, you knew, well, it's not necessarily the end of the world because I've been beaten by this person who I'm very suspicious of? Um, on To be honest, on that podium, the, what I was trying to do was hold myself together. Obviously, from the time we finished competition to the time we, we got to the podium, there was not a lot of time in between, so I really had to have, hold myself together. I was obviously very emotional, but... Um, I just we stood up there and, and made sure that I enjoyed getting the silver medal at the time. Um, and then she she got the glory. She cried all her crocodile tears, and she did you shake her hand? Yeah, I did. Yeah, and I went up and you know had my hand over, and you know we took the photo, the podium photo. I did congratulate her. If it wasn't outside, it, it wasn't outside in the stadium because we obviously were dealing with the end result differently. But um, inside the medal, the holding medal ceremony room where I did congratulate her and Kolotko for winning the bronze medal. So There's also a, a, quite a nice story there. I think it happened after London where you were competing. I think it might have been London somewhere where a fellow shot putter from Belarus came up to you. It was actually at the competition at, at the Sorry, finals. at the competition. Was yes. It, sorry, yes. So straight after my sixth throw, and that was the last yeah. um, f- last and final throw, I was obviously very devastated and just h- sort of held my head in disappointment and, and, and shame and I walked out and she came up to me at before even Ossip Truk went up the throne she said to me congratulations you won the woman shot put now I, I just sort of laughed and and, um, and ha- ha- how, did, how did you figure that out well at the time I, I was more angry well yeah. more, more disappointed at myself but I just sort of um, had a little chuckle at she it she was sending little, you a message wouldn't she well probably yeah <laughs> probably mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I mean she is from Belarus so yeah <laughs> she knows eh? she knows what goes yeah, on yeah. there okay let's turn to the other business uh, this is in London, your registration, which was a near miss, which had degenerated into a bit of a mess or a bit of a farce in the end. An athletic, just recapping, an athletic.
athletics official Raylene Bates from Athletics New Zealand admitted she failed to tick a box on a piece of paper and it uh, nearly caused you to miss. But you make it very plain in the book that Dave Curry, the chef de mission, should not have named her as he did in a press conference and should have taken full responsibility. And in your own words in the book, you say he, Dave Curry, hung Raylene out to dry. And then you asked in the book, why did he do that? And you say, Dave Curry was just covering his butt. Uh, clearly you were not impressed with the performance of the chef de mission over this whole business in London. Absolutely not. You know, I, I sort of felt for Raylene and I, you know, obviously what she did was a human error. It shouldn't have happened, but it did. And we actually had a meeting the day after the competition, myself, Nick, my manager, Dave Curry and Jean-Pierre, and we made the decision to and to come out. Obviously they had to face the media. Mm. There's no mm. doubt about it. And it was um, Kieran Smith and Dave Curry. Now, I said to Dave Curry on a number of occasions at that meeting, please do not name anybody. This is not fair on Raylene. Raylene still has a job to do with the other athletes. He said, yes, I'll not do that. I promise, you know, this is not going to happen. I'm going to go out, you know, we're going to take full responsibility, yada, yada, yada. And what we had agreed on, I trusted him on on the decision that we did make, along with with Nick and and Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre wanted what I wanted. And uh, two, three hours later... I come back to the Kiwi house and he's done the opposite thing and mm. he's just hung her out to dry. Like, you know, like a rag dog and a, a doll. And the most disappointing thing for me was actually reading a couple of days later a interview on a paper where Raylene's husband came out and uh, obviously Raylene didn't speak at all to the media but Raylene's husband described how hurt Raylene was by it and, and with it. Now, I saw Raylene in, in the village um after that, and I apologise, and you know, was just really felt did, for her. Did you speak to Dave Curry at all after the press conference? No. Did you feel like you w- wanted to? No. Wouldn't you wanted to have given him a mouthful? No, you know, it was just a, it was not not the right place, not the right time. You know, I just you know kept the kept the straight face, and um, you know, had to sort of keep um supporting the rest of the team that were there and, and still competing. And did Dave ever has Dave ever contacted you since that? No. So you have no relationship with him at all now. No. Mm, okay. <laughs> uh, with me also is Phil Gifford that helped uh, that helped uh, write the book. Uh, and I imagine, Phil, when you wrote this chapter here, there's some fairly serious kind of allegations going on here, as, as um, Val has just uh, repeated here. So you probably would have had to have checked all of this and made sure that it was right. So what Val was telling us here and what was in the book was, as far as you're concerned, absolutely the gospel is gospel here. Absolutely, and I mean one of the things one of the things that I think was very worthwhile uh, and a help to being relaxed about putting these fairly strong allegations in the book is that it wasn't just Valerie, as she said, Nick was there as well, and so you've got Valerie, Nick, and Jean Pierre who all heard the same statements being made at the meeting where, in, as a prime example, yeah. a promise was made that Raylene wouldn't be known. That, that was very clear in everyone's mind that uh, there no one would be mentioned, but least yep. of all um, Raylene, Raylene Bates. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, mm. And, mm. And, and, so, um, and, and, and the other thing that I knew, particularly with Valerie, was that one of the things that I discovered working with Valerie was that Valerie has almost like a photographic memory, or she seems to, because... She used to tell me things when we were first working on the book, and I'd go online just to double check the figures, let's say, for something mm. she'd done. And without fail, she always had it right, you know. And so I thought, well, if you've got a good enough memory of things that yeah. happened when she was 13, 14, 15, I have no problem but, uh, with you, relying on if things happened a couple of weeks ago. You know Dave Curry well as I do. We've both worked with him for a number of years. Yeah. It was a little bit. Um out of what you would expect from Dave. He's always been, a, in my books, a very sincere man of, of his word and integrity. And it's odd, therefore, that he would breach such an important undertaking uh, at this press conference. The only thing that I would say about that is just in thinking in general terms, not specifically about Dave Curry. I think we've all, throughout our lives, had people who, when there's been no pressure on them, have behaved impeccably. And, and to a degree, you, you, you do it yourself. The measure of a person is when there is real pressure on them, how do they behave then? And if you think back on it, Dave's never really been under any pressure as a manager before. Well, Everything's gone well I don't know. I think, yeah, as you well, go, you go well, back to on, go, back to to go back to Delhi. Go back to Delhi. Well, go back to Delhi, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, I mean, compared to this, mm. I mean, Delhi, that was nothing to do with the was, New Zealand team's fault. It, it was, was him bricks and mortar, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, him complaining yeah, about bricks and mortar. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't an error on the New Zealand team's fault. Now he's got something inside his own team where there's been a an error made, a human error, and it's a small thing in a way, just a tick, but it could have been catastrophic for Valerie. Mm. So mm. suddenly you've got a guy that's got a situation where this clockwork machine that's always run smoothly before the New Zealand mm. team 
all of a sudden it's falling over. Uh, it seems very evident, Val, from what followed, just going back a few days, that uh, when this hiccup, if I could call it that, mistake was occurred, it put you under pressure. Did you genuinely feel there for a while that you, you may not be competing at London? Absolutely. I mean, I know what the consequences are of um, not being entered. And I think the worst thing of the whole situation is that nobody had the decency to come to my room and tell me that I wasn't entered. I actually went online and found out myself. And then mm. I went running after people. Now, in a situation like that, in the track and field team, there was eight athletes. There wasn't that many people. There was only two athletes competing on the Monday. So I thought if anything to sort of um, minimize the damage, someone would have come to my room and said, you know, just mm. to let you know, this is happening. Don't worry about it. And it never happened. No. And so how did it affect you when you got down there into the stadium to compete in the in the qualifying rounds, first of all? Well, first of all, actually, um, the first the first core room I was the right to go in because we got our numbers beforehand, the entry, and then obviously you get confirmed. And when you get confirmed on the second core room, you get your numbers given to you, or your names in the front that get mm. given to you. I turned up and uh, they didn't have my name and my name wasn't on the list. Now, as everybody else was com- um, warming up and getting ready to go out to the stadium, I was I was sitting there for like 20, 25 minutes, literally about to shit my pants, <laughs> just about to cry and begging them to please look on the on the list and look look on the computer or something because I'm on it. I actually sat there and just looked at them. It, it and cost, them. Did it cost you distance when you started throwing? I didn't qualify in the first round, Brendan. I mean, that's something. I mean, eighteen, nineteen is something I do in training yeah, exactly. my, all yeah, the, with the time eyes with the eyes yeah, closed. Yeah. You know, and I was just so put off by that. And instead of warming up, I'd cool down. I'd try to, you know, when I went out there, I would try to find as much energy as I can. I had four hours sleep that night. You know, something that it's. I mean, I know the Olympic the next day, but four hours sleep is, is not mm. very healthy. But. uh it was very difficult. It was a very difficult time and, and difficult moment because Osapchuk was in my, my pool and, uh, you know, she was walking around and doing her thing and it wasn't the competition and it wasn't the ideal competition for such a major event in my mm. life. We're just about out of time, uh, Valerie. Just just one thing also about the, the parting of the ways with Karen Smith, your long-time coach. She Kirsten. says, Kirsten, uh, K- Kirsten, sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Kirsten, hell yeah. <laughs> I can't read my own writing here. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you, she says in the book that I, I think I can't give you anything more to improve on. Uh, yet between the two of you, she had guided you to gold medal at the Olympic Games, World Championship titles, uh, Commonwealth Games, and a whole bunch of other things as well, which uh, made you the world-class athlete that you still are. So w- what did you take from that? I think I can't give you anything more to improve on. Um you know, obviously, as as coach athlete, you know, our relationship had started off from a very young age. I was very young, and you know, we had a great relationship. Um, we just got to the stage where I wasn't advancing as an athlete, you know, distance wise, and uh, I suppose that's what she meant by it. Um, Could you understand that? Yeah, in in a way, I can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for for two years there, I I hadn't advanced them on my PB for a little while, you know. So obviously that's very difficult. But um, you know, and well, it was a very hurtful but, situation for her and I. But there also had, had, as you refer to in the book, there had been periods, hadn't there, in the immediate past when you keep referring to the silent treatment that was yeah. going that you were getting from her. Yeah, I mean that was just, I suppose, her way of dealing with things when we were at events or um situations that we were in and that's something that I can't control that was just her way of doing it and but it was very difficult on me because we were rooming together mm. and you know it's it's, it's kind and of she ain't a, talking to you yeah I mean it's it's kind of a sour situation for for both parties and um, unfortunately you know things happen and well, when you look back now and you analyze yourself and we tend to be our own strongest critics when we look at what we do do you think it's all worked out for the best that under JP now that you are a better uh, all round thrower than you were when you left Kirsten. The facts are out there that it is. That's basically what's happened. Um, you know, I am a better athlete. I'm a lot fitter and faster and more dynamic. I, I'm throwing a lot further. I'm more consistent over twenty and a half, late tw- um, twenty-one mm-hmm. meters. So, mm-hmm. as an athlete, I'm so much more better. And you know, th- th- that was just the right time um, that it happened. You know, 2010 was was a hell year for me, but the timing couldn't have been better. It was Commonwealth Games year. Um, there was no major events. Commonwealth Games is, you know, is a big competition, but the competition for women's shot is not that high. So it all happened at the right time. Obviously, leading up to mm. London, I didn't want to leave any stones unturned and made sure that, you know, I was in the best position possible to go into London. Now, when I met Jean Pierre, 
he just he transformed me as an athlete and um that is shown by the results that i have have been able mm. to produce in the last two years you presumably want to improve i look at the all-time list in the women's shop putting you still over a meter off the world record yeah. um i imagine unless you decided to go down that road uh, of taking drugs you're probably not going you're probably not going to get to that are you no the only drugs i'll take is corned beef tar and power <laughs> but um <laughs> so how far do you think you go can you get to 22 meters you know that's a million dollar question and something we all got to wait and see um do you want I, to do i want to yeah any athlete wants to yeah um but my but my aim of the game now is to make better myself as an athlete better my distance and at the end of the day my my goal with jean pierre is always to win a competition that is our first and foremost goal as the one competition. Yeah, but you don't have any specific things in mind. I mean, you, the world champs every two years, of course, Commonwealth Games and Rio. Is that 28 years of age? You'll only be in your prime, won't you? 32. Well, I, world, world champs next year. I'm going to um, try there for my fourth world title. Never been done in the woman's shot put. And then, obviously, Rio is, is the big one in the next four years. But four years is such a long time yeah. away, you know? Sort yeah. of when we think about it now, we're going to go to Rio, going to go to Rio. I'd love to be at Rio. My, my, my mind and my... Uh, motivation is to Rio, um, and so is Jean Pierre's. So that's obviously a good thing. I'm happy in my life. I'm happy with what I do, and I enjoy what I do, and which is important. Well, thank you, uh, Val. We wish you all the best, and, and Phil, with, with your book. I know you've got a very busy time coming up, and uh, we thank you very much for your time, and well done. And let's hope there's a few more medals that they uh, you. are going <laughs> to hang around your neck before you no finish. <laughs> well, when, when would you when would you expect to retire? What age? Um. At your age, Brendan, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you're going to win more than four gold medals then. That's what let me tell you. Yeah. Maybe when I'm a master or something. <laughs> so, I mean, wh wh where do shop putters, a lot of them go into their late 30s, don't they? Yeah, late 30s, early 40s. But yeah. sort of my deal is I've ex advanced to the top at quite a young age. So now my my um, aim is to maintain being at the top. And that's the hardest part. So mm. for as long as, you know, the body's in one piece and injury-free, then Just I'll keep, keep going. going. Yep. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Val.